Ladies, gentlemen, and every individual in between, it's time for me to open the book on another story. It's time to tell the story of another trade deadline. Last year, we did 2017. The year before that, we did 2015. This year, we're turning the clock back even further than before, going back over 10 years to 2012. A Cy Young winner was traded, an MVP runner-up was traded, a championship-winning team tore everything down, and the World Series winner from that year stocked up and got the pieces they need. It is a wonderful story. It's not in this book. This is just a random book I found in the office. I've been lying to you. Let's waste no more time. Let's get right into it, and if you enjoyed today's video, make sure you subscribe to my channel, like the video, and ring the bell for all future notifications. Let's go. We'll start this video one month out from the actual deadline itself. Contending for their first playoff berth in 15 years, the Baltimore Orioles were hamstrung in trade requests with their desire to protect both of their top prospects, number one overall Dylan Bundy and number two Manny Machado. Obviously, one half of that sentence is kind of funny in retrospect, but I digress. They got a deal done early to add some thump to an already thumpful lineup. Is thumpful a word? Maybe. Joining six guys who had finished the season above league average hitters was Hall of Fame slugger Jim Tomey, who was still 25% better than the league average hitter at age 41 for the Phillies in his final season. They got a pair of prospects that never panned out in the end, a common theme in the 2012 deadline. For Baltimore, Tomey continued to hit well after his tour at June and contributed to a lineup that won 93 games that season, claiming a wildcard spot. The Phillies, who traded Jim Tomey, would be dismantling a championship-winning squad, but before we can get to that, another team was taking the spotlight for some selling off everything they had, though this team doing so was a lot less surprising. Pretty much every baseball fan knew that the Houston Astros were preparing to tear things down heading into 2012, and they'd bring in over 15 prospects through a flurry of selling trades beginning on the 4th of July. First to go was renowned slugger Carlos Lee, who was in the last of a six-year contract he had signed with Houston back in 2007. The Astros saw zero playoff berths and just one winning season in this window, but not because of Lee's performance. Before 2012, Carlos Lee averaged 25 home runs and 100 RBIs a season for the Astros and became arguably the most underrated member of the 300 homer club. In 2012, his final season, the 36-year-old Lee had slowed down a bit. The Astros traded him as a rental to a surprising destination in the Miami Marlins, who were stumbling through a mediocre season in the first year of their new branding. Lee had been league average with the Astros, but as soon as he got to South Beach, the signs became clear that this would likely be his final season, with a 654 OPS in 81 games. The Marlins, a 500 team when acquiring Lee, lost 10 of 13 games in mid to late July to swap from buyers to sellers. More on their fire sale later. Houston received third baseman prospect Matt Dominguez in the deal, the first of many prospects who failed to move the needle in the ensuing years of tanking for the Astros. Next to go was starter Jay Happ, who initially came to Houston two years earlier in the Roy Oswalt blockbuster. Happ never fully settled in with the Astros, pitching to a 4.84 ERA in parts of three seasons at Minute Maid Park. He was packaged with reliable reliever Brandon Lyon in a massive 10-player trade with the Toronto Blue Jays. The huge buy-in was surprising for Toronto, who sat a game under 500 at 46 and 47 when the deal occurred on July 20th. In need of pitching behind starter Brandon Morrow and reliever Casey Jansen, this trade was not enough, as the team completely sputtered with a 19 and 37 record in the final two months. They protected their farm system but dealt their number 9, number 11, and number 12 prospects, the only of whom to pan out into a good big leaguer being pitcher Joe Musgrove. He did most of his great pitching away from Houston. Houston being a centerpiece in the Garrett Cole trade later on. Outside of that, it was a prospect haul gone wrong for Houston and a player haul gone really wrong for Toronto. A day later, Houston traded again, selling closer Brett Myers to the Chicago White Sox. Myers had been a good starter in the two seasons prior and transitioned well into a bullpen role in his age 31 season. Though the White Sox were doomed to a second place finish despite all of their buying, Myers did his part, pitching slightly better for the South Side than he did for the Astros. Chicago protected their top 20 prospects but dealt away three minor leaguers in the deal, the only one of note being Chris Davinsky. Though he tailed off after their World Series win in 2017, Davinsky was essential to Houston's eventual championship winning bullpen with a dominant two-year stretch as their long reliever. This trade was a big win for the Astros. Three days later, big shocker here, Houston traded again. They had the everything must go sign plastered on the front side of the stadium practically. The longest tenured Houston Astro to be traded and the final lasting member of the 05 NL champion team, Southpaw Wandy Rodriguez, was 
was shipped off to the Pittsburgh Pirates. He had taken a while to develop, but was pitching his fifth straight season with a positive ERA+, plus, and was easily the ace of the lowly Houston staff. With two and a half years left before free agency, Houston got a nice haul, receiving the Pirates' number eight prospect, Robbie Grossman, who's still playing now over a decade later. Wandy pitched fine for Pittsburgh, but couldn't stay healthy or consistent beyond 2012. The Astros had again pulled the trigger at the right time, but didn't get the return they likely desired. Last to go was third baseman Chris Johnson, who had been plagued with high strikeout numbers and inefficient defense in his time with Houston. He was honestly great as a rental for the Arizona Diamondbacks, with a 117 OPS plus in his last two months out in the desert. In a farm system considered to be one of the best in the game at the time, the Astros netted second rounder Mark Krause, who never found his footing in the big leagues. Bleacher Report initially gave the Astros an A grade for their deadline performance, and while it was everything they set out to accomplish, it's hard not to look at the return with hindsight and think of it as a failure. The Astros received 15 prospects total, less than half of them made the major leagues, and altogether they combined for 3.0 wins above replacement across all of their time played for Houston, most of that being Robbie Grossman. In the dealing of five quality big leaguers, Houston put together about three future wins, which was probably a big reason for their ensuing 100 lost seasons. Let's finally get off the Dark Age Astros. Out in the American League West, an unfathomable move was becoming a reality. Despite their impressive starting rotation, the Seattle Mariners were five games under 500 in mid-July, enduring their fourth losing season in the past five years with no end in sight. They had no substantial candidates for a big trade to replenish their farm system outside of one rental that absolutely nobody wanted to see leave town, Ichiro Suzuki. Ichiro had become a legend, coming over to MLB at age 27 in 2001 and putting together an unbelievable decade-long stretch where he missed just 32 games total, eclipsed 200 hits every season but one, won the batting title twice, made 10 All-Star teams, won 10 Gold Gloves, 3 Silver Sluggers, an MVP and a Rookie of the Year, and etched his name as one of the best hitters of the 2000s. In 2012, he was going through his first subpar season of his career with a meager OPS Plus of just 82. Seattle decided to sell low on the legend, trading him to arguably the most hurtful destination possible for Mariners fans. On July 23rd, Ichiro Suzuki became a Yankee. They received reliever Danny Farquhar, who was a solid relief pitcher for a few years down the line, and DJ Mitchell, who never pitched for the Mariners. Needing a replacement for the injured Brett Gardner, the Yankees were ecstatic to see Ichiro turn a corner in the Bronx. He hit 322 and helped the Yankees win the division. He even scored his first playoff home run later on in the ALCS against the Tigers. Ichiro's two seasons beyond 2012 were below average, but outside of his numbers, this whole transaction is a confusing blip in MLB history. Well, now that we all got a little breather, it's time for another fire sale. And who better than the crown masters of the sell-off than themselves, the Miami Marlins. Just two weeks after buying Carlos Lee from the Astros, the Marlins opened for business in their most disappointing season arguably ever. After a flurry of free agent signings for Jose Reyes, Mark Burley, Carlos Zambrano, and Heath Bell, Miami was calling it quits halfway through. The first to go were some of the longest tenured Marlins, too. Over in the AL Central, the Detroit Tigers were attempting to return to the championship series for a second year in a row, hoping for a different outcome. They needed to upgrade their rotation and defense if they wanted to stave off the White Sox for the crown. They found the pieces they needed in one big trade with the Marlins, acquiring starter Anibal Sanchez and infielder Omar Infante. Anibal Sanchez was a true rental, and if you're interested in rental trades, I just did a whole video on those. He pitched so well in the second half and postseason, though, that the Tigers ended up signing him back in free agency, and he would go on to win the ERA title in the season that followed. Omar Infante aided the infield defense in his return to his original team, and managed a career-best 115 OPS Plus in the 2013 season a year later. Later. Throughout their tenure with the Tigers, these two combined for 11.8 wins above replacement across multiple seasons, a big win for the Tigers. In return, Miami did get Detroit's number one overall prospect and the number 22 prospect in all of baseball, pitcher Jacob Turner, as well as number 16 Rob Brantley and number 10 Brian Flynn. Turner and Brantley were solid in their first year, but by 2014, each of these three guys imploded and were sent elsewhere. A move that looked promising for the Marlins at first ended up becoming an utter failure. The bigger move Miami made came just two days later, now just six days removed from the July 31st deadline. Since 2006, Hanley Ramirez had been the face of the Marlins, a Rookie of the Year, an MVP runner-up, a three-time All-Star, a batting champion, and over 1,100 hits as a Marlin. Hanley was a star player. But come 2012, after the signing of Jose Reyes, he was reportedly disgruntled with the front office for making him change positions and failing to secure him an agreeable extension. With free agency a year and a half away, Miami pulled the trigger. The Los Angeles 
Angeles Dodgers, who had failed yet to secure a big trade, took a risk and dealt away their promising number two prospect, starting pitcher Nate Eovaldi. Hanley was great in parts of three seasons for Los Angeles, helping them win the National League West in 2013 and 2014 before reuniting with Boston on a big contract. Eovaldi had some growing pains, but eventually turned into a dominant starting pitcher who's contending for his first Cy Young this season. Miami didn't get to see much of that great pitching for their own team though, dealing him again just two years later alongside Domingo Herman in a big trade for Martin Prado. This pair of midseason swaps were a failure for the Marlins for many reasons, but perhaps most of all because they failed to trade starting pitcher Josh Johnson, who was clearly the second best pitcher available at that year's deadline. The best pitcher available was holed up in Milwaukee. The Brewers made everyone and their mother aware that they were prepared to trade away former Cy Young winner Zach Greinke. He originally came to the Brew Crew in an off-season deal that helped the Royals build their future World Series winning core. Less than two years later, he was on the move yet again after the Brewers failed to agree to an extension for his services. The 2012 Brewers were within striking distance in mid-July before they lost 9 of 10 games to close the month as sellers. Many teams like the Chicago White Sox and Los Angeles Dodgers were keen on getting a deal done, but the surprise suitor in the end was the Los Angeles Angels, who had been quiet at that year's deadline up until this point. The Angels were 10 games over 500 and well within reach of the first place Texas Rangers, and now they were adding Zach Greinke to an already stellar rotation of Dan Heron, CJ Wilson, and Jared Weaver. Granke, who was a true rental, pitched just those last two months for the Angels and was pretty good, not his usual dominant ace self. He signed with the crosstown rival Dodgers that offseason and won the ERA title in 2015, posting an unbelievable 1.66 mark. The Angels won 89 games in 2012, but finished in third place and missed the playoffs entirely. In the Granke deal, the Angels weren't burned a ton outside of trading Gene Segura, an eventual two-time All-Star who had his best years after leaving Milwaukee. For both sides, they might have found better partners elsewhere, but this deal didn't really hurt or benefit either side greatly, which is why not many people tend to remember it. You may be wondering, this has been an eventful deadline in retrospect, but why haven't the World Series winners from that season done anything yet? Well, we're finally here. The San Francisco Giants definitely bided their time, but beginning on July 27th, they made a flurry of moves that would become integral to their eventual Fall Classic trophy. The first came within their own division, too. Despite being 25 games under 500 in dead last place come the end of July, the Colorado Rockies were remarkably quiet at that year's deadline. You know, some things just never change. The lone deal they made was trading away newly acquired infielder Marco Scudero. After posting a 74 OPS plus for the Rockies, the Giants picked him up and turned his season around, nearly doubling that value. Scudero hit 362 in over 60 games for San Francisco and also won the National League Championship Series MVP award that year, hitting 507 games. Even with his initial low value, the Rockies got a decent piece back in Charlie Culberson, who's still kicking around MLB even today. He was never great for the Rockies, but had some real highlights down the line. Considering how small the move was at the time, both sides came out pretty good here. Now just three days away from the trade deadline, the Chicago White Sox entered panic mode. Seeing the Tigers make a big move to fix their roster and watching the Brewers trade Zach Greinke elsewhere, there were few options left to help fix their ailing rotation. After losing John Danks to elbow surgery for the season, they needed a fourth arm to complete the set of Jake Peavy, Chris Sale, and Jose Quintana. Like our last trade, they found the answer within their own division. To that point, Minnesota twin starter Francisco Liriano might have been the most inconsistent pitcher in the entire game. He'd be the ace of some very good Pirates teams down the line, but was enduring his third season in the last four with an ERA above five. With his free agency around the corner and the twins going nowhere, they decided to sell low on the former All-Star and Cy Young vote-getter. The main piece going back to the twins in this deal was number four White Sox prospect Eduardo Escobar. Escobar collected over 500 hits and over 60 home runs in seven solid seasons for Minnesota and eventually netted them flamethrowing reliever Yohan Duran in a subsequent trade with the Diamondbacks. As for Liriano, he was just as bad with the White Sox as he had been in Minnesota that season, maintaining his poor ERA and failing to move the needle for a south side team that would miss the playoffs by just three games. The airwaves went surprisingly quiet in the next two days, leading us to the July 31st deadline with deals still to be made. Our third and final fire sale team was perhaps the most shocking of all, being that they had made the playoffs in each of the last five seasons and won the National League pennant twice. But in 2012, it was clear to the Philadelphia Phillies front office that their championship window was officially beginning to close. The departure of Roy Oswald, the decline of Roy Halladay, and the injuries of Ryan Howard, Chase Utley, and Placido Polanco signaled the beginning of what would become a multi-year deconstruction of the roster. 
It all officially started at this deadline, with the Phillies dealing two key pieces to both sides of a classic baseball rivalry. The Los Angeles Dodgers, who had been active already, made the first move, getting a deal done for the flying Hawaiian outfielder Shane Victorino. He had come up through the Phillies system, won three gold gloves, made two all-star teams, and was set to finally hit free agency in that offseason. Originally poached from the Dodgers by the Phillies in the Rule 5 draft eight years prior, the two sides came to an agreement. Even in a down year by his standards, the Phillies netted three players players from the Dodgers for Victorino, including established reliever Josh Lindblom, a trade wouldn't pay much dividends in the end for either side, with Victorino's numbers worsening in his lone half season in SoCal. He signed with Boston that offseason and got himself his second World Series ring almost immediately. The Phillies' larger deal came soon after, with the Giants seeing the activity of their rival and feeling the pressure to make another move themselves. Just a year after trading a prospect haul to get him from the Astros, the Phillies made Hunter Pence available with his free agency a season and a half away way, and the Bay Area juggernaut pounced on the opportunity. Pence was solid for San Francisco and eventually signed a five-year, $90 million extension at the end of 2013. He smacked nearly 100 home runs in parts of eight seasons with the team, making two all-star teams and winning two World Series with the club. The Phillies received number six Giants prospect, catcher and first baseman Tommy Joseph, as well as established outfielder Nate Cheerholtz. again, another move that failed to move the needle in the ensuing dark years for Philadelphia. As the clock winded down, the grand finale of this year's deadline came from an unexpected face. In 2012, Ryan Dempster was in the final season of a very successful five-year deal and overall tenure in Chicago. The starter tossed well over a thousand innings in a nine-year stretch with the Cubs, though the latter half of those nine years were certainly better as he transitioned from reliever to starter. He was going out with a bang in this season, tossing 16 starts with a 2.25 ERA, including a 33-inning scoreless streak through June and July, the longest such streak by a Cubs pitcher in 50 years. The Texas Rangers had failed to get anything going during the trade deadline and made their move to pounce on the ace. Battling an injury to their pitcher Colby Lewis, this seemed like a perfect fit, except it didn't end up being so. Dempster tailed off from his great first half and a dozen rough starts for Texas, with an ERA over five and three key losses in their last four starts. What made the move all the more worse is what the Rangers gave up to get Dempster, arguably the best prospect traded at that year's deadline. Former eighth round pick Kyle Hendricks was the big piece the Cubs got in return, and was one of the essential pieces to kickstarting their return to relevance in the mid-2010s. He's tossed over 1,300 innings total with a 3.46 ERA and 87 wins, including an ERA title in 2016. To this point, he's already produced over 20 wins above replacement and is still going. As for Dempster, he left the Rangers after 2012 for one more season with the Red Sox before retiring. And that is the story on the 2012 MLB trade deadline again. Not a real book. I don't know why it would be in that book. If you enjoyed today's video, guys, make sure you leave a like and subscribe to the channel. We do trade videos all the time, so I think you'd really enjoy the other ones that I'm going to put on the screen somewhere at the end of the video. But before I can let you go, I got to tell you about today's sponsor, which is, of course, the DraftKings Sportsbook. Right now, new customers can go to the DraftKings Sportsbook, download the app, bet $5 on any pregame wager, and win $150 in bonus bets instantly with code OLIVE, O-L-I-V-E. It's in the channel name. I say the word all the time. I trust you know how to spell it. And if you want to use that bonus bet money on some other stuff, I highly suggest Same Game Parlays. You can combine multiple bets from the same game for a shot and an even bigger payday at the end of your day. Which team is going to win? Is your favorite pitcher going to strike out six or more batters? Who's hitting a home run? Combine all those bets for a shot at a big payday. Go download their free and easy to use app now. Use code OLIVE, my code. It really helps me out and helps my channel out. Bet $5 on any pre-game wager and win $150 in bonus bets instantly only at the DraftKings Sportsbook. Look down below for any resources you might need for a gambling addiction or gambling problem. We don't want anybody getting hurt. We just want you guys having fun betting on the games that you love day in and day out. Thank you to DraftKings for sponsoring today's video. And guys, I'll see you next time.